Welcome to Ethan's Storytime Online, brought to you by Ethan and Chaco's Book Club at Chalk Children's Hospital. My name is Kim. I am 14 years old, and I live in Tustin, California. Today I will read to you a book called Island, a story of the Galapagos, written and illustrated by Jason Chin. Okay, so... This is the front cover. You can see some of the animals and plants that would have resided on the main island. So let's go ahead and begin. Part 1. Birth. Six million years ago. The sun is rising over a lonely group of islands more than 600 miles away from the nearest continent. The air is still and the sea is calm, but beneath the water, something is stirring. A volcano has been growing under the ocean for millions of years. With this eruption, it rises above the water for the first time, and a new island is born. How do you think this is possible? What process could cause an island to be born from the eruption of a volcano? Each time a volcano erupts, lava spews forth. Eventually, the lava cools, becoming hard black rock, and the island grows and grows and grows. Many years pass. Frequent eruptions have made the island treacherous and nothing lives on it so far. On this page you can see the process that the volcano took. You can see that as lava spews forth it gets larger and larger. One day a seed falls from a tree on one of the older islands. This seed floats for weeks and eventually arrives on the new island. In time, a tree begins to take root. Later, a seabird will discover the island and stop for a rest. This seabird will decide to make it its home. Marine iguanas will swim in from one of the older islands. Their long claws will help them cling to the slippery rocks as they climb from the sea. Their powerful tails will propel them as they dive to eat the green algae below the surface of the water. Their blunt snouts will help them to crop the algae close to the rocks it grows on. Life has now arrived at the island. Part 2. Childhood. Five million years ago. After one million years, the island has grown. The eruptions are less frequent, and it's easier for plants and animals to live here. The water around it is full of fish, and seabirds will gobble them up in feeding frenzies just offshore. Mangrove trees will flourish in sheltered coves along the coast. Their roots form a tangled maze in the shallow water and provide a home for sea turtles and young sharks and rays. Land iguanas will float to the island on logs and branches. Once on land, they will climb up past the mangroves and settle on the island slopes. Why do you think animals have able to made it, make life on this brand new island? Now that seeds have been growing, why would the animals choose this island over an older island? After two million years, the island has become one of the largest in the group. Because of its height, more rain falls on it, and it is home to more life than ever before. Old lava still scars its slopes, but it has erupted for its last time. Now that it has finished to erupt, it will sink very, very slowly into the ocean, less than a millimeter per year. This is what the island would have liked to looked like around five million years ago. Why do you think it looks so green? There are different climate zones on, at different elevations. Rain and fog will frequently cover the upper slopes, and the ground will be covered with plants. Farther down, the terrain will be dry and dusty. Land iguanas will burrow in the soil. And on sections of the coast, the crashing waves will have worn away the rocky shore into sandy beaches where sea turtles and marine iguanas can lay their eggs. Meanwhile, in the waters to the west, new islands are being born. One day, a seabird leaves and lands on one of the new islands. She starts a new colony. Eventually, more of the island's plants and animals will colonize the new islands, including marine iguanas, mangroves, and land iguanas. Why do you think the trees are able to move from island to island? 
What is carrying the seeds? Part 3. Adulthood. Three million years ago. Three million years have passed since the island was born. Several hundred younger islands have grown and merged into each other, forming one enormous landmass. Our island is no longer the largest, but many new species have come to its shore, and many continue to arrive. Seagulls arrived years ago and now nest on the rocky cliffs. Penguins have come from the south. The water surrounding the island is just cold enough for them to survive. Birds like frigate birds live near the coast. They are pirates and steal fish straight from the mouths of other seabirds. Pelicans will nest in the mangrove trees and fish in the island's sheltered lagoons. Over the next million years, more species will arrive. Sea lions from the north will establish colonies on the island's beaches. What do you think makes it possible for penguins who come from Antarctica, where it is very cold, and sea lions who come from warmer climates to live together in the same area? Could it be that different sections of the island are heated differently? In a distant land, a flood washes a group of tortoises out to sea. After floating for weeks, the ocean currents will carry them to shore. Across the ocean, some cormorants, which are a type of bird, are lost at sea. Luckily, they can find the island and plenty of food just off its coast. A group of finches is forced from its homeland. On the Galapagos Island, they will find plenty of food to eat. The island is now four million years old. It has continued to sink and it becomes smaller, and as it becomes smaller, less rain falls on it. Droughts are more and more common. During a drought, few plants will survive. Fewer plants needs fewer seeds for the finches to eat. It doesn't take long for them to eat most of the seeds on the island. Now only large seeds remain because they're difficult to eat. Most finches' beaks are sadly too small to open them, and they will die of starvation. Only a few finches will have slightly larger beaks than the rest, and they can open the larger seeds. They survive and in time, they will be able to have chicks. The chicks will inherit their parents' beaks. Since only larger beaked finches survived, only larger beaked chicks are born. This generation of finches has slightly larger beaks than the other generation. The droughts continue, and with each, the finches' beaks become a little larger. Over many generations, they gradually grow very large, because larger beaks will help them survive the droughts. Here, in this bottom set of pictures, you can see the progression of the size of beaks on the finches as the droughts continue. Over millions of years, other species will change too. Some seagulls will begin to hunt at night. In this time, their eyes will become larger, and this will allow them to see better in the dark. The tortoise's shells will change shape too. As the land becomes drier, their shells become smaller and turn up in the front. This saddle shape is better for keeping cool and navigating the desert. One kind of seabird changes, but this is not due to the changing climate. The feet of these blue-footed boobies, who were originally yellow-footed, turn blue to help them attract their mates. You can see here that in the original, the boobies have yellow feet, but now they have blue, and you can see how the bird seems more attracted to the other one in this picture than in this one. Animals often use the bright colors to attract mates, such as in peacocks. Snails that live on the island mostly live in the moist highlands and are changing as their environment becomes drier. Their thick round shells get smaller and thinner, better suited for the new climate. The cormorants' bodies get heavier and their legs more powerful, allowing them to swim faster and deeper to catch more food. On the island, as there are no predators to escape, they have no need to fly. Little by little, their wings shrink, and eventually they are so small that the cormorants can't fly at all. You can see here that the wings are very short compared to the wings here. Part 4. Old Age. One million years ago. 
After five million years, the island has become low and flat. It's also smaller and drier. Seabird colonies still swarm over its cliffs. Tortoises still plot across the soil, and marine iguanas and sea lions still live on the rocky shores. But some species can no longer survive on this Indian island. Thousands of years pass, and the island sinks farther. Now it's only suitable for a few species. Most of the plants and animals are gone. Eventually, it shall be reduced to a small rock, barely rising above the water. It is lifeless once again. Here you can see the change in the island from when it was low and flat, to when there were a few species, to when it is just a rock, which you can barely see. Finally, nearly six million years after the island was created, it will sink below the waves forever. Part 5, Epilogue, 1835. It's been many years since the island disappeared. There are now 15 larger islands, and on them live the descendants of the plants and animals that once called this island home. The plants and animals here have adapted to the environment on these islands, and many of them exist nowhere else on Earth. Eventually, these islands will sink beneath the waves too, and new ones will emerge. As they change, their plants and animals will change with them, moving from one island to the next, somehow finding a way to survive. This is the Galapagos Islands. So, I love this book because it teaches us many facts about the history and nature on this island. And it teaches us a lot about evolution and adaptation to new climates and surroundings. Now, before I say goodbye, I would like to ask you one final question. What do you think was the most important animal or plant that contributed to this island, and why? Give yourself a couple minutes to think that over by pausing this video. Okay, well, that concludes our time together. And thank you so much for reading this book with me.